My name is John McClellan, and I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee today. This is August 30th, 2010, to interview the Honorable Chancellor Richard E. Ladd. This interview is taking, taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. We're all looking very forward to getting Chancellor Ladd under cross-examination today. Chancellor, if you would, would you uh, state your full name? Richard Edward Lyad Sr. All right, and what was your date of birth? January 22nd, 1936. Uh, can you tell us where you were born? Oliver Springs, Tennessee. Now, for those that maybe are not familiar where Oliver Springs is, could you kind of give us a little geography lesson here? Half of Oliver Springs and uh, uh, Anderson County, and that side's close to Oak Ridge. Of course, Oak Ridge didn't exist then. Uh, Oliver Springs was a spa many years ago with large hotel back when uh, various type of springs felt like, the, uh, people felt like they had health benefits. Okay, so it was kind of a vacation center for folks and I understood in the days used to like to come to spas and take mineral baths and all this sort of thing? Yeah, they probably came from 50 miles around. Well, <laughs> good recreational money for the town, huh? And then uh, Oak Ridge, of course. You say that didn't exist then? and No, Oak Ridge, of course, was built during World War II as part of the development of the atomic bomb. All right. And was TVA existent then when, when you were born? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, when war broke out, my father uh, was 4F for the draft and took a job as a TVA policeman at Norris Dam. Okay. And uh, Anderson, and you said Anderson County, and, and what other counties involved in oh, there? Oh, my mind's gone blank, John. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Okay, all right, we'll get back to that. And you mentioned your dad, or your grandfather, I guess, and your dad working along that project. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and maybe let's start with your grandparents? <clears throat> right. My paternal grandfather, Frank Ladd, who was son of another Frank Ladd, and the older Frank Ladd had another son, a brother to my grandfather, who's grandfather to Senator Howard Baker. Oh, so you got a relation here. Yes, but I'll, I'll get to that a little later. I'm the black sheep in the family, the Democrat. <laughs> and uh, you, you didn't, everybody else in the Ladd family have been Republicans. <laughs> Senator Baker didn't have you to Washington every Sunday. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my maternal grandfather, uh, Edward Duggins was a uh, carpenter in the mines and uh, went to Florida at one time during the boom and came back on the bust. And uh, I look forward, I thought today this was going to be done at the Tennessee Supreme Court building in Knoxville. My uh, maternal grandfather, Ed Duggins, was a janitor in uh, that same building uh, back when it was U.S. Post Office building. Oh. And I would visit there uh, down Main Street in an old apartment building owned by Eugene Mundy, and it's where the present city county building is. And I was telling you during lunch that I remember we were on the third floor they didn't have a refrigerator, they had an ice box. And my grandmother let me put the sign in the window so the house company man, when he came around, would know whether to get any 25, 50, or 75 pounds of ice. And he'd carry it in a big leather swing on his back three floors up to the apartment. Now, now you said your grandfather went down to Florida during the boom? Right. And what would he, what, what, why would he go down there? What would be As his a, work? I don't remember the years, 
He also... Uh, was it a building boom or something yes, like that? Yes, or at one time, many years ago. Now, when exactly this was, I'm not sure. Uh, when he was a very young man, uh, before he was married, he also fought in the Spanish-American War, went to Cuba, and I uh, have his rifle uh, in their family room at home. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your dad and mom? Yes, they were both born in Oliver Springs, uh, both good athletes. Mother was outstanding high school basketball player. Back then there were three on a side <laughs> and she was a forward. That's a side that could go to the center line and could shoot. Uh, her junior year she scored more than the opposing teams combined and went to LMU on some kind of small scholarship to play basketball, Lincoln Memorial University at Harrogate. But then uh, she and Dad decided to get married the first Christmas of her freshman year. She dropped out of school to get married. My dad uh, was an excellent athlete and uh, went to the University of Tennessee one year walk-on football player. Saw he wasn't of that caliber. Transferred to Maryville College in Maryville, Tennessee. Then in a pileup, he had a severe fracture of bones in his face. Back then, uh, colleges didn't have any insurance and uh, he never did get back to college. I then bet he there went to Spartan School of Aeronautics in Oklahoma to learn to be a pilot and mechanic and so forth. And while he was there, uh, Wiley Post uh, and a bunch of the old time uh, famous pilots came through there. Amelia Earhart before she was lost. Mm -hmm. All came through there. But while he was there, my grandfather died and uh, that dried up the income, so he dropped out of that. I'm just going to say, when he got his face crushed up, I blew, did they have face masks on helmets back then when they were playing football? Oh, no, no. Leather helmets, no face masks. Yeah, yeah. I guess that was frequent. What about, what about the community there where you grew up? Are there any friends you had that maybe we might know of them? Yes. Uh, as I said, he moved to Norris, Tennessee which was built by the Tennessee Valley Authority when they built Norris Dam in 1936. Uh, Norris was an unusual community. It was built as a federal project, an, uh, a modern model community, and everything in the town was owned by the Tennessee Valley Authority. The streets, the stores, the houses, uh, we rented a house there, and uh, if you had a plumbing problem, you called TVA, they sent out a master plumber. If you had an electrical problem, you called TVA, they sent out a master electrician. If your dog had puppies and you didn't want to keep them, you called TVA, and somebody came and got them, and I don't know what they did with them. <laughs> but uh, it was socialism at its finest. But the... <laughs> The irony of all, my dad and mother were the only two Republicans in the whole town of 1,200. Then my uncle and aunt moved there, so we had four Republicans in the whole town. To be able to have a Republican primary one year, they had to solicit some of their Democrat friends to be poll officers, because you had to have something like six poll officers to have a primary. So it was, it was interesting. Uh, after working for TVA, Dad and another man leased the boat dock at Norris Dam. And as I was going through high school, uh, he and his partner ran the boat dock. My wife, uh, I beg your pardon, my mother, fried hamburgers and cooked omelets at a little uh, restaurant on the boat dock. 
and uh, I worked as a deckhand there. The boats didn't have refrigerators, so we had an ice house. I'd carry ice out. I'd pump gas for the boats and uh, bring boats in from off buoy lines and uh, just general work uh, on the boat top. Did you play any sports since you had this athletic background? I seem to have lost the gene somewhere. <laughs> I played everything, none well. One thing I did get pretty good at was uh, water skiing and uh, riding a plywood disc behind a speedboat. Naturally, growing up on the lake, I had an opportunity to. Uh, tried to play high school basketball, high school baseball. School was all 12 grades in one building. It was owned by TVA, of course, and uh, TVA contracted out to the University of Tennessee to run the school. And at one time, the building was the largest electrically heated building in the world. Uh, then, uh, after the war, TVA held an auction on the front steps of the school and sold off the town. And the company that built Levitt Town in Pennsylvania bought the whole town. Then they had to survey all the houses before they could sell them because there were no lot lines since TVA owned everything. So whatever house you lived in, you had uh, the co excuse me. <clears throat> the company gave the family that lived in the houses uh, the first opportunity to purchase the house. Okay. Uh, would the families be rent renting those TV own, TVA owned houses then? What, yes. You remember about what they'd pay a month for rent? When we first moved there in 1942, I think it was about. $35 a month, hmm. plus electricians, plumbers, <laughs> and all that. And uh, each one of them had a, a coal bin, a concrete prefab coal bin, but they also had plug-in electric heaters, which were unusual at that time. When, when you were in your childhood there and your friends, did you have any friends that maybe some of us would now know that were they were either well, became lawyers or professors over at the university? Two, uh, two houses up from our house, uh, Chancellor Robert Brandt, who served many years in Nashville, uh, lived two houses up from us. A uh, classmate of mine was Jerry Phillips, who uh, Instead of going to the University of Tennessee, he went to Yale and then Cambridge and then back to Yale and then ended up as, before his death in many years, as professor at the University of Tennessee Law School. Then one summer playing uh, baseball, uh, he was from Maynardville, but we had a combined team. Jake Butcher was the pitcher on the, the baseball team. <laughs> Oh. My closest friend growing up, though, was uh, uh, Jim Artman. And Jim and I spent a lot of time together. Uh, we built a boat together in his basement. Uh, it was a kit boat. And then bought an old outboard 22 and a half horsepower Evinrude. And uh, had a good time on the lake with it water skin, et cetera. And uh, now Jake Butcher, now this is the same Jake Butcher that went through the uh, Valentine's crash of banks here in Tennessee some right. years back. And to be fair to Brother Jake, uh, he did a lot of good things for Knoxville too. He and his brother got the World's Fair to Knoxville. They cleaned up a malfunction junction because of the fair. So. Uh, you know, it was a pretty good trade out for Knox for an end, I think. Now, you mentioned uh, a Cuba. Did, you, did your oh, family travel in? Well, my mother and dad never had much money, but they loved to travel, and they always took me with them. 
the main travel was to UT football games. Mm -hmm. I can remember one player on the Tennessee team in 1939 when I was three years old. But they took me before that. I just don't remember it. But then, uh, since you ran a boat dock, we had to have our vacation in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And one year we went to Florida and went all the way down to Miami. And Dad, with a limited budget, we'd go about three blocks off the beach, and he'd go in a hotel and ask them how much they'd rent a room for. And if they had some, he would dicker with them to get as little price as possible. And one day he was looking in the Miami paper, and they're advertising round trip flights to Havana, Cuba, $35 round trip. So we drove out to uh, Key West, climbed on an old DC-3, and flew off a grass strip. The, the runway wasn't even paved. Landed somewhere in Havana, Cuba, and spent two nights over there. <laughs> Rather than soaking in all the local, my mother was particular about food. She found a Walgreens drugstore in Havana, and she and I ate every meal at the Walgreens <laughs> drugstore. <laughs> Is this the same Walgreens uh, that we know today? I don't know. I don't know because <laughs> when I was in Japan, I know I bought clothes at a J.C. Penney store, and it sure wasn't the J.C. Penney <laughs> that we have here. But I suppose it was. This was, of course, pre-Castro. Batista was uh, the number one there, whatever he called himself. Uh, uh, now, when you were uh, up in North and, and going to the high school there, did, um, of course, did you, what, what got you interested? Did you have a teacher that kind of gave you some uh, uh, some things, put things yeah. in your head that maybe got you to where you wound up here? Ms. Thelma Hickson was a very special person. Some reason, she followed me. She changed grades as I did for three or four years and was my teacher three or four years straight. Very talented person, very talented artist. Uh, now, was this I hated her. Was this was in elementary school? school. Elementary school, okay. I hated her along with everybody else because she made us diagram sentences all the time. <laughs> uh, but she was a very special person. And uh, around about the sixth or seventh grade, she told me I need to go to Yale or Harvard and be a lawyer. And I poo pooed that. Then she told Jerry Phillips the same thing. And Jerry Phillips did it with no money. Jerry went to uh, Yale on a uh, music scholarship and worked in the restaurant up there. I didn't have the courage to do that. Well, let's uh, kind of leave, uh, leave that and maybe uh, take a look at college. Uh, where, tell us where you went to college, undergraduate. I went to University of Tennessee, never thought about any other place. I had uh, uh, two good reasons. I didn't know any other place, and two, couldn't afford any other place. And uh, had a partial academic scholarship that paid for my <clears throat> tuition and books. And uh, since I was right next to Oak Ridge, I had this grandiose idea. I started out in engineering physics. And in my sophomore year, two things happened. Uh, I got real interested in the Air Force ROTC program and flying. And I started having four-hour chemistry labs. <laughs> and one I really liked, one I didn't. I bet I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I switched over to the College of Business. Uh, Tennessee had an excellent major in air transportation in the College of Business. And my long range plans was to go to the Air Force, become a pilot, and at some point get out of the Air Force and uh, fly for an airline. Well, when you were at UT, did you uh, live in a dorm or did you live with your parents or how did you? How? Part of the time in a dorm, part of the time in a fraternity house. Uh oh, which fraternity? 
uh, capacity and uh, that was an education in itself for a country boy from Oliver Springs, Tennessee. I was going to ask if you were going to get any studying done while you were in the fraternity <laughs> house. <laughs> but uh, I, of course, went to the Advanced Air Force, ROTC, and they had a program where uh, a certain few each year could get a regular commission rather than a reserve commission in the Air Force. You'd get the same commission as if you'd gone to the Air Force Academy. So I got that and went into the Air Force. So even with all your experience on the water and, and run deck handed and all that, you didn't go in the Navy. You I wanted you went knew to the Air I didn't Force. want to go in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have had enough of water. <laughs> so I went to Texas to pre-flight, then went to flying school in Malden, Missouri, which is in the boot hill of Missouri, which touches Tennessee. A lot of people are not aware of Missouri touches Tennessee, uh, out across from Real Foot Lake. And uh, the craziest thing at that time in my life was not flying. Uh, the craziest, my wife-to-be was going to school at Vanderbilt then. And I get through flying school at six o'clock on Friday evening and, and sign out and uh, drive all night. Had to cross Mississippi on a ferry boat. There are no bridges between Cairo, Illinois, and Memphis at that time. Drive all night in pre-interstate to Nashville or back to Norris and visit with Isabel Saturday afternoon and get up Sunday morning and drive back and it was at least 12 hours from Malden to Norris. Well, what's Isabel's maiden name and, and then how did y'all even meet? Well, Isabel's maiden name was Sigworth, S-E-I-G-W-O-R-T-H. Uh, her father was a TVA before he retired, he's director of forestry and game and fish for TVA. And they actually lived just about four or five houses from us on a different street. But Isabel was two years younger than me, and I'd skipped a grade, so the three years difference in school, which if you recall, if you can think back that far, John, <laughs> that, that made a lot of difference, three years. So. We really didn't start dating till must be at, uh, when I was a junior or, or maybe even senior in college, although we knew each other, mm -hmm. uh, no dating. And then uh, she uh, went to UT for summer school once so she could graduate in three years. We both agreed with her father that she should finish Vanderbilt before we got married. Okay, did she get a degree then at Vanderbilt? Yes, yeah, she was, unlike me, she was a honor graduate in mathematics <laughs> at Vanderbilt. It's never let me forget. <laughs> uh, when did y'all, when did y'all eventually marry? We were married on the day of the Auburn football game. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now you've, <laughs> you've got me, John, I have to think. <laughs> but I had nothing to do with setting the date of the marriage. I was away in the Air Force at the time. And uh, all my family diehard UT football fans. The only good thing was that it was an early game and the marriage was laid on the Saturday. And uh, all of my family went to the first half and then drove from Knoxville out to Norris uh, for the wedding. Some of the wedding pictures shows uh, me and the groomsmen around the radio listening to the game. <laughs> Do you remember? We the, did win three to nothing. <laughs> three and to nothing. Well, that was a heck of a Scored in the first half, game, so then. my family got to see all the score. <laughs> what were you doing in the military before you came home? Uh, flying school didn't work out. and. I guess because I have a regular commission, I had a choice of what I wanted to do. And somebody told me about the Office of Special Investigations. 
So I was uh, transferred, orders sent me to Washington, D.C., and I took a school how to be an agent in the OSI. And in the Air Force, unlike the Army and Navy, uh, we had both criminal and counterintelligence duties. And former FBI agents were primarily the instructors. And uh, so that's where I live when Isabel and I were married, and we moved to an apartment in, uh, outside of D.C. You think that's where you might have honed your skills for detail uh, that you, I know you later used as a judge in lawsuits? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> After I got through agent school, I was doing uh, security investigations. And one, one little incident I remember uh, very fondly, uh, somehow one of the forms to do man to do a security investigation. People, let me back up. You had to put references down this standard form that the entire people and got government clearances had to fill out. One of them was references. Well, most people put down the most impressive people they didn't think of. Well, one of these references on the form handed to me was a certain dress, and when I got there, it was the White House. And I pulled my badge and my credentials out, the White House Guard, and they said, that, that doesn't do anything here. <laughs> so that made me mad. So I went next door to the headquarters of Secret Service, and I got in to see the head of the Secret Service in charge of the presidential detail. And while we were talking, he had a, back then, their voice boxes. And I heard this voice say, I'm departing, I'm departing. He says, I'll be back in just a few minutes. And he ran out, came back in a few minutes, said, every time the sun's shining, Ike wants to go play golf. And that was <laughs> President Eisenhower speaking, <laughs> going to Burning Tree uh, Golf Club. So he said, oh, I'll get you in to see this guy. I'll sign a, a young agent to you. So he assigned a young Secret Service agent to me. And we're walking across the White House grounds, and all I'm doing is a security investigation where the guy should be given a clearance. But this agent was young like me, and he looks and says, all we ever do is guard the president. What is this, a sex crime or something? <laughs> I said, I'd love to tell you, but I can't, I can't reveal what this is. It's secret. <laughs> Went in, and the guy inside was very nice and gave me a telephone number, said any time I went back to the White House, just buzz him. Well, I got back to the office, and all hell broken loose. We weren't supposed to be in there. But they couldn't blame it on me. They <laughs> gave me, I did the job I was given. So then uh, things went haywire after that. Uh, I received orders to go to Misawa, Japan the Honshu is the main island in Japan, and Misawa is at the northern tip. It was, during World War II, it was the uh, naval base where the Japanese formed up to go to Pearl Harbor, mm. or now a U.S. base. And uh, Isabel was expecting their, their first child, and of course had to stay at home. And over there, I lost interest in the Air Force. It limited, in OSI, there was limited promotion because it's too small an organization. So I turned in my resignation and it was accepted. And luckily, it was right in between Korea and Vietnam. Uh, if it had been a little earlier or a little later, they wouldn't have let me out. But uh, I got out. and. Yeah. Uh, how long were you actually over in Japan? About a year. About a year. Well, I bet that was kind of interesting. Hmm? I bet the culture was interesting for it you. It was. I, I like Japan. I'd like to go back again, but I don't think I could ever afford it. It's expensive there. But now it's what, 110, 120 yen to the dollar. When I was there, it was frozen, 360 yen to the dollar. 
So uh, things were very inexpensive. Did, then did you resign out of the military and, and come right. back home? Yeah. Is, is this about the point in time when you decided maybe look to look at a law school? No, I came back and got a job as an insurance adjuster at $300 a month. And uh, the boss says, you work hard in a few years, you'd probably be an office manager and make four or $500 a month. So I had an uncle that was a very Leonard lad, who was my dad's brother. He was a very fine lawyer in Harriman, Tennessee. And I told him I was thinking about going back to law school. And he said, I would discourage you to come with me. It's too small a town. But if you want to, you've got a spot here. So I had an insurance policy going back, because there I was. I had a child and a wife. And uh, so Isabel had a friend's father was head of the school board in Anderson County. And he got Isabel a job teaching. So she took her Vanderbilt honors degree in math and was teaching phys ed at the Norris <laughs> High School. <laughs> and uh, I went to UT Law School. They looked at my grades and said, I saw Dr. Overton and Dr. E.E. E. Overton, and uh, he said, no, there's no scholarship. So I took law school admission tests, and I got a notice that I had a scholarship. Uh, well, tests have always been easy for me. Oh, Dr. Overton's well known to a, a lot of us yes. there. And uh, how would <laughs> well, you describe the, when you Dr. went into Overton law school and met a, Dr. Overton? Excellent, excellent professor, very knowledgeable, and like a lot of professors, very egotistical. And uh, if you allow me, I'll tell two short stories on him. On my freshman quarter, of course, in law school, they were all essay questions. When judicial administration, which is a freshman course, we showed up for the test, he pulls it out, and it's 400 true and false questions. Everybody was in shock. And he says, I want to warn everybody, it's going to be penalty graded. If you get it right, you get two points. If you, get it, if you don't answer it, I don't charge anything. If you get it wrong, I take a point off. Well, we took the test and came back after Christmas. We were on a quarter system then. And I had a note to see Dr. Overton. And I walked in his office and he says, all right, smart Alec, you're the only guy in the class that answered all 400 questions. Some of them didn't answer but 200. Why'd you do that? I know you didn't know the course that well. I said, well, Dr. Overton, you know, You've seen me playing cards up in the lounge. And uh, I sat there while the others started answering questions and thought just a minute. Let's say I guess 200 out of the 400. I'd say I'm going to get 100 right and 100 wrong. And I get 200 points for the 100 I guess right and just lose 100 for the 100 I guess wrong. So I come out 100 points better than anybody else. And since I'm a card player, uh, I thought I could guess more than half of them. He said, all right, smart Eddie. <laughs> so that's all. He never gave that test again. <laughs> you actually answered it. And then later in school, he taught an excellent constitutional law class. But a good friend of mine had taken it ahead of me and was much more industrious than me. He typed up notes daily and switched over to a red ribbon and typed exactly what Dr. Orton said on each case. So he gave me his notes. And instead of sitting on the front where I generally did, I sat in the back with his notes. And Dr. Orton would as usual, I asked questions, and I'd let two or three people try to answer it, and I'd raise my hand, and I'd paraphrase exactly what he'd said the previous quarter. <laughs> How'd that work? Well, it worked fine for 
a few days, Dr. Overton finally said, Lad, I don't know what you've got back there, but I don't want to hear any more from you the rest of the court. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you ever have any interchange through a, another notable UT professor, Martin Ferrick? Oh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your association Dear with Dr. Martin Ferrick? Ferrick? He's a wonderful man. He was the one that separated the sheep from the goats at UT Law School. My first quarter, there were right at a hundred of us. And nine quarters later, I think 28 graduated. Back then, they let anybody in the law school that had a degree from UT or possibly comparable school. And then they weeded them out after they got them there. Well, I started working for Mr. Ferrick uh, in the law library uh, after my first quarter and worked all the way through school for him in the law library. Uh, one student that was a, a friend and worked together in the library is Donnie Payne. Uh, Donnie hadn't been in the service. He and I must have been about the same age. He might have been a little younger, but uh, we, uh, we, everything. And this I, is the same Donnie Payne that teaches this seminar for all these years? Correct, helps us. right. And uh, Lowry Klein, a very fine lawyer. In fact, we tried to get him to come to Bristol, and uh, his wife wanted a bigger city for the arts, and he ended up in Chattanooga. Uh, Billy Joe White, the chancellor in Tazewell, Tennessee. Uh, Wheeler Rosenbaum, the circuit judge in Knoxville. Uh, Luther Eisenhower from Bristol, a leader, as you know, of the community up there. And uh, Paul Wilford, who a relative of years and passed away a couple of years ago, a very fine lawyer. Uh, and uh, couldn't ask for a better friend than Professor Ferry. He, he'd gone to law school at uh, Columbia, I believe, and was a native New Yorker, had a lot of connections up there. and. Uh, he got, uh, he was on the committee selecting order of the COIF, the Honorary Society in law school. And uh, he got me on order of the COIF, except one of the requirements, order of the COIF, you write for the law review. Did you write a bunch of law review articles? I didn't write any. Not I a single listed, one? I was listed on the law review, but he knew I was struggling. <clears throat> So he found me a couple of writing jobs that paid money. Uh, one for the state, from the state of Tennessee through a grant. So he convinced the other members of the committee that I fulfilled the writing requirements. It's just they weren't on law review. And uh, then when I got through law school, he wanted me to go interview on Wall Street. He felt sure. I had pretty good grades. Lou Haygood and I bounced back and forth uh, for first. Actually, after the first year, Wheeler Rosenbaum and I shared the Green Scholarship. We had, which was the biggest money-wise scholarship there. We took it away from. Uh, uh, Charlie Susano, who got oh. with the year before. Yeah. And this is Charlie Susano, who's uh, on, on the spring Corp Appeals there. And then uh, Wheeler is a uh, judge, judge in, uh, in Knox. Knox County. So we shared the Green Scholarship then. Uh, Wheeler chose not to go to summer school the first year. So we got a quarter ahead of him. So from then on, uh, uh, Lewis Haygood and I battled for number one. And Lewis figured out what Dean Wicca, 
uh, who's in law school then and was quite a character. Uh, what Dean Wicker liked, I never could figure it out. So Lou beat me out at the end. <laughs> well, was, was, was Mr. Haygood, uh, was, was he a card player too? No. He wouldn't do it? No. You know, he, he started out in my dad's office and came up and, and, and came through there. I've known him for years. He's a, he's a very good lawyer. Well, I resented. I knew he'd had several years as an economist, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, he was the economist. But he'd been in the law office for right. a number of years. We'd send him out to evaluate the labor union situation, so we sure did. Uh, was there a placement officer office at UT back in those days? No. How Before I graduated, Harold C. Warner became dean. Mm -hmm. He was dean in waiting back in World War when World War II started and went away in the <clears> service, <throat> JAG Corps. And uh, just about all the professors gone. So when they need a dean, whoever's before that, Dean Wicker got it. So Colonel Warner, when he came back from the service, had to wait a number of years to he got the position he should have had many years before. He was a wonderful man, a wonderful teacher, and as dean, he was placement officer. So I told Mr. Ferrick that no way a Tennessee hillbilly from Oliver Springs, Tennessee could fit into <laughs> Wall Street. So then Dean Warner wanted me to uh, go interview in Memphis at uh, the Armstrong firm. I think it's probably the largest firm in Tennessee at the time. And uh, once again, I'd been moving out of the mountains. I couldn't, couldn't see that. So then he got me two interviews in the Tri-City area, with Hunter Smith, which is a big firm in uh, Kingsport, and with Charles M. Gore, who had one partner at the time, but he was dying of a brain tumor. We all knew that. And, uh, Mr. Gore was a special person, kind of a renaissance man with a lot of interest other than the law, and uh, was I this? was impressed by him, and I decided I'd rather be in a two-man firm and a large firm like Hunter Smith. And this was in Bristol? And that was in Bristol, right. Hunter Smith, Kingsport, Mr. Gore's in Bristol. So you accepted the job position with Mr. Gore? That's correct. Okay. As Mr. Gore and I, uh, before I got there in December, latter part of December of uh, 63, his partner died. And uh, there was Charles Gore and I, and Miss Allie Freeman was the one secretary. This was, as I say, 1963. Miss Allie had come to Bristol from Southwest Virginia as a young girl to work in Mr. Gore's father's law firm in 1919. So she, <laughs> she had been around a long time. <laughs> Wonderful lady. If you can picture what the ideal secretary in 1919, that's what Miss Allie Freeman was in 1963. Did she know more law than most of the lawyers? <laughs> no, she would never. She would never. She take. would not take things on herself like that. She had a manual roll typewriter and <laughs> used two fingers on each hand to type. We did not have a copy machine, fax machines were unheard of. Internet had better, never been invented. And uh, if we got a, a doctor's report and one sent it to the insurance company, she had to copy it on the typewriter. Uh, what, had you passed the bar already when you went into Mr. Gore? No, no, I got through I don't know, early December 63, and I, we need money. So I'd made $300 a month as a said insurance adjuster, so I went with Mr. Gore at $300 a month after three years of law school. <laughs> and uh, so he immediately put me to work at $300 a month. And then not too long after the first of the year, they had the the 
the bar exam. And you know me, John, I tend to be overconfident at times. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't take the cram course? <laughs> no, I just worked there and went down. I did go down one day early and uh, talk to some of the guys that had taken the so-called cram course to see what they had to say and took the... And you say we need the money. Tell, tell us about your family at that time when you first started with Mr. Gore. Of course, you had Isabel and... And Rick, and who's Rick. now a, a trial lawyer. Okay, and I think yeah. since then you've got a... And Rick is a trial lawyer and he practices he's, with... He's a shareholder in uh, Penn Stewart home base in Abington. His office is in Bristol, Tennessee. They're... 33 lawyers in the firm, I believe. It's, I think, the largest firm between Roanoke and Knoxville. Okay, so you've had your uncle, yourself, and, and now a son, Rick. Is that right. correct? That's been in the law. Uh, well, obviously, you got through the bar exam. Yes. Uh, what I depend on, I wasn't the smartest guy in the world, and I recognize that, but I seem to have the ability to pick issues out. Mr. Ferrick said in his classes, he told me, uh, I didn't get all the answers right, but I always could find four times the number of issues of anybody else. And uh, I depend on that. I think in the bar, if you recognize what the issues are, you're going to pass the bar exam. Yeah. It doesn't make that much difference what answer you get. Just didn't find the issues. Um, tell me about uh, when you got in with Mr. Gore, and that was mainly, uh, what would you describe? Insurance General defense? practice, General really. Practice uh, do you, do you he represented a few insurance companies. Uh, he represented several local corporations, both the corporate work and a couple of them on labor management. Okay. Uh, now, a little bit of title work, even a little bit of collection work back then. Did you and I it? gradually kind of took over the litigation, primarily defense work. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about. Do you remember, what, uh, did you start having a jury trial pretty soon after you started with Mr. Gore? First one came up after I passed the bar. You remember? He went down there with me, said, he may have stayed through the first witness, I'm not sure, and said, I'm going back to office. So. I, How'd you feel about that time? I felt like I'd finally got to what I always wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what's, what case? It was case? a lot of fun trying lawsuits. What's the most memorial, uh, something you've got in your mind that just sticks in your head that you well, look and grin about? Well, one of the first case, it may not have been the first case, but we had one representing an insurance company, of course. The uh, Aaron Sheward had been out all night playing poker, and he was coming back home early Sunday morning and saw three of his friends by the roadside. They flagged him down. They didn't have a car. They wanted to ride over to a fellow Preston somebody that cut hair and gave shades in his house. So my friend being congenial, picked him up and went over to Preston's house where they're all getting a haircut and a shave and drinking moonshine liquor. They ran out of moonshine and uh, so they got into my client's car to uh, go find some more moonshine. My client by then was really tired having been up all night and the moonshine didn't help <laughs> so he picked the soberest one of the five put him under the wheel, and he got in the back seat and went to sleep beside Preston, the barber. Unbeknownst to him, the meanest man in Hickory Tree, it's a section, bad part of Southern County, was in the front seat with the driver and uh, got pretty nasty, so the driver stopped, got out, and the meanest man in the community got behind the wheel. And he started driving fast all over the area, and the sheriffs kept trying to catch him. He'd outrun all the deputies. 
finally ran off the road and broke a utility pole down and Preston got hurt in it and took him to the hospital and he said, ugly to the emergency room people, they said take him back home and he, so they threw him back home he showed up next day sober with fracture in the spine. So he sued my client, he was a friend but the friend had insurance on his car so he sued him for his injuries. Well, Preston had a real bad speech impediment when he was sober. It disappeared after he'd been drinking. But he was on the witness stand. The complete defense back then, of course, was if you rode with an intoxicated driver or reckless driver, you couldn't recover. Contributory negligence. So he had an old time lawyer representing him. I was defending. And his lawyer said, Now, Preston, we've heard about all this drinking and fast driving. Why didn't you tell the driver to stop and let you out? He said, Well, well Mr. B -B Burr, I t -t -t tried to, but -b 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 before I could get out, we done had that damn wreck. <laughs> So that's probably the first memorable <laughs> case I, I had. And then, you know, Barris and some of the other. <laughs> Lyle Burris? Yeah. <laughs> now he was a character, wasn't he? Yeah. Mr. Burr was outstanding lawyer. He's a recovering alcoholic. He admitted it. Uh, stopped drinking when he went to bed in Bristol one time and woke up in Knoxville in a fair good hotel <laughs> and uh, never drank after that. And When I started practicing law there was no uh, real civil procedure, it was all common law and uh, I'd go to Lyle when I had a common law question. He knew all my answers. On it. He might say there's a recent case on that, Dick. A recent case may have been 1886, I don't know, but <laughs> Lyle was a veteran of World War I, had been in, a, uh, I think he was in the military academy when the U.S. got involved and he came home and formed up a company. Did you enjoy trying lawsuits? Very much so. And uh, what did you like about being in a, what was fun about trying a lawsuit that you enjoy? Competition. I think all good trial lawyers are intense competitors. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about lawyers. Doctors don't hate each other or fight each other. Carpenters don't. Businessmen don't. Lawyers go into public in the courtroom and try to make their friend across the courtroom a fool. And yet, lawyers, when the case is over, at least the vast majority of them, that friend is still a friend. They understand that's part of the game. And that's why. I well, you know, that's a. That's a, uh, a thing. Do you think the younger lawyers understand that like they used to back when, back when we were doing that sort of thing? All right. Why don't we, let's just take a short break because I'm getting ready to get into your career and how it evolved there. Why don't we just go ahead and take a break now? Now, Dick, uh, as you got on with your career, career, I'm sure your family grew also. Correct, Tell us John. a little more about your present family. Uh, as I told you earlier, Rick, Richard E. Jr. was born while I was in Japan, which wasn't a very pleasant experience. But then five years later, after law school and we were in Bristol, uh, our second child was born, Michael Ramsey Ladd which you're interested in, the middle name Ramsey, yeah. so family name from my wife's family, and uh, it's a O. Scott name, yeah. S-A-Y. And, then, and uh, Michael was not an athlete, a very uh, 
good student, went to undergraduate school at uh, Davidson College outside of Charlotte. Then uh, do the middle name, one of Isabel's great uncles left him a few pieces of stock when he was born. Time he graduated from Davidson is worth a little bit. And I thought it was foolish at the time, but he spent it on a round the world trip by himself and uh, ended up in France. Uh, while he was in Davidson, he majored in German and took his junior year abroad in Marlborough, Germany, became fluent in German. So when he ended up in France, he took a one-year course, an uh, intensive course in French, and became very fluent in French. Then he went to London and got his MBA from London University. And uh, after that, he worked for a small company that had offices over, all over Europe and the United States. Then went on his own, and he's now an independent consultant, travels the world, telling big companies, mostly pharmaceutical companies, how to better market their product. And he's still single, and he lives in Hamburg, Germany. Isabel and I visited for a couple of weeks last year and had a grand time. Rick, uh, my older son, went to the University of Tennessee, not much of a student until he suddenly got interested in law, going to law school and really applied himself the last year and a half and squeaked by to get into UT Law School and uh, put himself through school. He worked at Grady's Good Time, the original <laughs> Grady's out in uh, West Knoxville and met his later wife. They were both servers at Grady's and finished law school and went in the Navy as a JAG officer, uh, stationed in Guam. Uh, his wife, Lisa, is a very uh, energetic person. She uh, completed a two-year apprenticeship as a pastry chef at the Guam Hilton while they're in Guam and learned it from uh, a Swiss trained pastry chef. And then when Rick got out of the Navy, uh, by happenstance he interviewed at Penn Stewart in Abington, Virginia. And uh, of course, wasn't very practical for him to come to Tennessee side at that time. So uh, he went to work for them. Lisa came back a few weeks before he was out of the Navy and was hired as pastry chef at the Martha Washington Inn in Abington. Turned out not to be everything she thought of. It also involved making biscuits at six o'clock in the morning. Hmm. So she quit that job and went back to school and got her registered nurse degree and he's worked part-time since then. And after 14 years of marriage, a wonderful day, our one and only grandson was born. And Evan's now 10 years old. Wow. Not much of an athlete, but a superior student. Well, Very fine young man. I've seen you and Evan together. You have a lot of fun. <laughs> I've seen you and Evan together. You boys have a lot oh, of fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're very close. Do. And his with his grandmother, too. Yeah. Well, I played golf Saturday, Evan and Isabel played tennis together. Well, now, you had a son go into law. Do you recommend law as a career? You think I'd it's a recommend good law to anyone, no matter what their ultimate career is. And why is that? Well, in undergraduate school, and I think a lot of graduate school, things are black and white. They are absolute answers to most everything. Once you get into law school, I think if you're a good student, you recognize that about every issue has two sides. And the important thing in law school is to recognize those issues and the argument for both sides. And if you're going to go into business or government service or 
whatever you can think of, I think law school's excellent preparation. Did, did your employment with Mr. Gore, did it affect your political views? Very much so. How, how did uh, I guess that's where I became a turncoat. Uh, <laughs> I've told you I was the only Democrat in the family. Uh, that goes back many, many years aunts, uncles, grandparents. My mother, the day she died, still thought Richard Nixon had been framed. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Mr. Gore had been campaign manager for Upper East Tennessee, for Estes Kefal, for, for Senator Albert Gore. Uh, I became involved in the local party, vice chairman at one time. Uh, got involved in the first campaign of John J. Hooker, who was a little different back then than he was today. And uh, just seemed to fit. And of course, that was compatible with my father-in-law being TVA employee and Isabel, a strong Democrat. So that, that worked out that way. But who, uh, besides Mr. Gore, who, were there members of the Bristol Bar that affected you in certain ways Well, along your course? I mentioned Lyle Burr, who uh, had uh, been World War I, recovering alcoholic, but very, very knowledgeable of the common law. Uh, I can't think of any other names right now. I'm sure they all did. Uh, did you, from all of them. Did you, um, were you competing, you and Mr. Gore competing against the larger firms there in Bristol? Because there was what, maybe a dozen lawyers in Bristol during this time period? There, there were, and then uh, you had firms from even Knoxville and Kingsport going for what I was doing, representing insurance companies. Yeah. I developed network and I guess you'd call it today friends with insurance agency and with uh, uh, insurance adjusters and are able to bring in a company or two to represent uh, uh, ended up going down as far as Granger County which is a long ways because I'd had some luck with some cases was there a lot of collegiality among the lawyers back then? Very much so, yeah. very much so. Uh, get together on a regular basis at parties or picnics and so forth. And uh, that could be rough in the courtroom, but outside of the courtroom, it was uh, close friends with about everybody. What the community of Bristol there? And, and talking about the schools, talking about uh, who served on juries and this thing. You've seen some big changes, haven't you? I have. Time. It's hard. <clears throat> it's difficult to believe. Uh, there's an African-American lady at work for Mr. Gore and his wife, like a member of the family, and she had a son that was a teacher in high school. And uh, high schools were segregated segregated at that time. Uh, there was a black high school in Bristol, Tennessee, and a white high school, and a black high school in Bristol, Virginia, and a white high school. And uh, while I was still practicing law, the schools were integrated. And this one friend is a teacher in the black high school, a very fine young man. Uh, they said they didn't have a place for him the next year, that the consolidation they didn't need need anyone with his credentials. Then September comes around and they've hired some young person, white, to teach what he'd been teaching in the black school. And I tried to talk him. I guess the only time I ever tried to slips it. A case. Oh, you were going to volunteer your services pro bono in then? And uh, he moved out of Bristol. Uh, didn't get a chance to do it then. Was there, what about uh, uh, women uh, back then? There were then? no women jurors, no yeah. black jurors. It's strictly white men on the juries. There was 
one female lawyer in Johnson City, one in Lisbeth, and none in Bristol. So the whole Tri-City, I think, are two, uh, two female lawyers. The biggest change I've seen, uh, now I understand uh, it's about 50-50, if not more, female than male in the law schools. And uh, the big change I saw in 29 plus years as a judge with uh, female jurors, I think we got more reasonable common sense verdicts. Uh, men can be awfully narrow-minded. You know, I am, you are, and I think uh, <laughs> When? Now you're sounding like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's more of a jury of peers, I guess. Uh, uh, I think too many of the men worried about missing their work, whereas uh, the women, I think, were honored to be there on a jury and uh, tried their very best to do it. We are lucky and were lucky in Kingsport. As you know, uh, as judges, we hold court in Bristol, Blountville, and Kingsport, three courthouses in one county, it's the second judicial district. Mm -hmm. And in Kingsport, we've been lucky forever because Tennessee Eastman's by far the largest employer, and long before it's required by statute, Eastman always paid their employees uh, the difference between the 10 bucks they got as a juror per day and their normal rate of pay. And I think that also made for good juries in uh, Kingsport. I'm going to hazard to guess the female lawyer in John City, would that have been Shirley Underwood? Yes. <laughs> judge uh, Underwood. He, yeah, served as judge and, and was one of the leaders in uh, forming uh, Juvenile justice for in the whole Tri City area, so right. halfway houses and everything. Right, Finally. quite a woman. Yeah, she was. She was quite a woman. She sure was. Um, what do? What about uh, now? You mentioned when you first started, you didn't have fax machines. You didn't have all this sort of thing. Um, what What have you seen from a technological standpoint come into play? Both good and bad, especially for lawyers. Back then, we get a letter from a client. I remember a client in New York, he was surprised he got a letter back from us two weeks after he'd put a letter in the mail. Nowadays, with email, a client, I'm told by lawyers, that clients are upset, they get an email in the morning, and if they haven't answered the client by the afternoon, their client gets upset at times. So. From that standpoint, it's been bad. Uh, I'm so old-fashioned, I would be nervous with the method in U.S. District Court in Eastern Tennessee of everything being electronic, uh, no pieces of paper anymore. Uh, anything that comes over an email that's important enough for me to really read and digest, I have to print it out. I'm still old-fashioned. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about your career and then I'm, I'm going to hit you with a couple of bullets that I okay. think the conference has been going over with. Uh, uh, of course you practiced with Mr. Gore mm -hmm. and then a day came where you had an opportunity to consider maybe taking uh, the bench. How did that opportunity arise? Well Judge Howard S. Witt, there was a position in Sullivan County created by private act called Law and Equity Judge. Uh, he tried some circuit civil matters and some chancery matters. Judge Wood had had a heart attack too and been on and off the bench and he uh, left the bench for health reasons and didn't know how long he'd be gone. It was enough that they were going to appoint a special judge which means you would be there until Judge Witt wrote a letter to the governor saying he was able to serve again. So that was the opportunity I was faced with. Uh, I knew if I didn't try to get it and Judge Witt didn't come back, 
it'd be very tough, even if I chose to try to run, to who took the chance and took it. So against Mr. Gore's advice, who was like, and he was like a second father to me, I decided to try to be the one uh, designated as a special judge. And uh, I did. Uh, had some opposition from a Republican, but uh, he was a Democratic governor at that time. So. Uh, and, and who was governor? He was there, there temporarily. When I went down to get sworn in, he and his lawyer and the FBI were all in the Capitol. Uh, Honorable Ray Blant was the right. governor. But give Jack Governor Blanton credit, and I'm not just talking about me. He appointed some really fine lawyers as judges across the state. He seemed to rely on the local bar association as to who should be appointed. And I don't think there's a finer way in the world uh, to select trial judges and the recommendation local bar association. What, what factors, since you were kind of against Mr. Gore's recommendation, um, what, what factors did you consider? What swung you over to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this? Well, once I started practicing law, I saw I'd really like to be a judge. I had the difficulty of every case I ever tried. I could see both sides, and hmm. sometimes I had a hard time uh, advocating my side when I saw it probably wasn't the, yeah. the equitable side, the fair side. But I did it because that's what lawyers do, but it's difficult. And I must be the worst lawyer to bill it ever been. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't an insurance company, it was a private client, I just could not charge them because most of the time they were in trouble financially. They couldn't afford to pay a lawyer. And uh, as a result, I didn't make a whole lot of money. I was a very good trial lawyer, I think, but I didn't make a lot of money from it simply because uh, even they were representing insurance companies. Uh, uh, I can think of one case in U.S. District Court. I represented one defendant, a Kingsport lawyer represented the other defendant. I would have bet money we did almost exactly the same kind of work. He had occasion to tell me what he charged, and it was three times what I charged. You know, Joe Fuller, the famous defense lawyer in Kingsport, they used to tell the joke on Joe that he met his Lord when he was 50 years old, and the judge, and he came up to St. Peter, and Joe said, why did you take me so young? I was only 50 years old. And St. Peter says, well, Joe, I'm sorry we looked at your billable hours and figured you had to be 90. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. How, how long did you serve as chancellor of the second judicial district? Well, I started out as law and equity judge. And uh, one little sidelight. After a year, word got back to me that Judge Witt was thinking about coming back on the bench. He was worried about his health insurance or something. And Mr. Gore was a close political friend with uh, Judge Charles Neese, U.S. District Judge for Northeast Tennessee. One night I got a call from Judge Neese. said, Richard, the Congress has created a U.S. Commissioner, is that what they call him? What? What's the word? The innocent now. I think it was commissioner. Magistrate. Magistrate, U.S. Magistrate. magistrate judge is what they... U.S. Yeah. Magistrate. Yeah. Dennis Inman is now the magistrate right. judge in well, Greenville. Well, Judge Neese, this would have been 1978, said, we have to appoint a U.S. Magistrate, and it'd be decided by uh, Judge in Chattanooga and me and Judge, uh, who's Judge here in Knoxville forever? Anyway. Uh, uh, 
Would it have been Taylor or? Yeah, uh -huh. just Bob Taylor. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, John. So uh, he says, now, Richard, nobody really knows what the U.S. magistrate's going to do. <laughs> uh, the Judge Chattanooga and I will let you try cases, but I'll be confessed to you, Bob Taylor will probably make you a glorified law clerk. He won't want to give up any cases. And I asked for a few days to think it over, and I decided to stick it out where I was, and thanked him very much for thinking of it. So then I found out that Chancellor Hal Inman, the present magistrate's uh, father, who was chancellor a long time in Morristown, was a good friend of Judge Witt. He came up to Kingsport and had a long talk with Judge Verrett and convinced him that he ought to remain on disability, that it'd kill him if he came back on the bench. So he did, but I sat there for five years not knowing whether I'd be judge the next day. And then end of the term, uh, of course, I ran and luckily made it through 29 plus years without any opposition. You know, today we have baby judges school and all this, which I know you've taught uh, new judges. Uh, when you went on the bench first, uh, how did you know what to do? Did you have any training or anything? No. What was that first day like? Well, Judge Wedd had been sick a long time. And I walked in the courtroom that you were in so much now in Kingsport, pretty good sized courtroom, as courtrooms go these days. Every seat was filled. They were lined up around the walls. <laughs> And I thought, what have I got myself into? And then I found that if you ruled without hesitation <laughs> and a strong voice, it didn't make any difference whether you're right or not. Most of them thought you were right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I worked very hard very hard, day and night, and weekends for the first year or two. And, uh, and uh, I guess my only problem, we can talk about this more later, but I remember one of the lawyers, Tom Torbett, was in law school with me, a lawyer in Kingsport. And he was close enough to me to be able to tell me this. He said, Dick, your problem is uh, passing grade for yourself is 100%. <laughs> and uh, that was true. But my problem was, it's all right if I wanted to make my passing grade 100%. But if I had any weaknesses as a judge, I wanted everybody else to passing grade to be 100%. And that's not a nice thing to do. Well, that's, um, so that first day was pretty tough, and did, and did you inherit, you had quite a backlog. Right, and the... Uh, and did you uh, inherit a trial that you just can't get out of your mind? The first week, first week before I tried a case, uh, Judge Roger Thayer was circuit court judge, and we were in his family room downstairs his house with him teaching me how to be a judge. And uh, the phone rang and his Honorable Chancellor Dayton E. Phillips from uh, uh, Lisbeth, who also served as Chancellor in Sullivan County at that time. He says, Richard, I've got this little case that's a Court of Appeals is sent back. It says, you know how boring it is to try a case a second time. Of course, I didn't have any idea. I hadn't tried a case. <laughs> Would I try it? I said, well, sure, Chancellor. I'd be happy to accommodate you. Well, it was the members of the Teamsters Union suing their own union for violation of fair representation uh, at the Mason-Dixon truck lines. 
they decide to go on strike when they were under contract, which is unfair labor practice, as you know. And uh, so the NLRB came in and uh, investigating where the union leaders told these guys, said, now you all tell them you just did on your own. The union didn't know anything about it and we'll take care of you when it's over. Well, they took care of them, all right. Every one of them was fired, and the union didn't do a thing about it. And Chancellor Phillips had attempted to try it as a jury case, and it t turned into a disaster. And it, uh, so it turned out, it took a week to try. Lou Haygood, was representing uh, the uh, union members, the wronged union members, and the young attorney was representing the union. And on the, I guess, fifth day of trial, the jury came back about five o'clock, wanted a calculator and a pot of coffee. <laughs> About two hours later, they came back and wanted to know if I could put a C CPA in the jury room with them and could they have supper. <laughs> 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 well, Lewis got a big verdict, but the uh, national claim they didn't have any hand in it, so it was strictly the, the local union. and. Uh, I forget what they finally got. I made them put up their union hall with security on appeal. Uh, well, how'd you feel with your old friend out of law school, Lewis Haygood, on the other side of the bench? <laughs> Good. Lewis is a fine lawyer. And it's, Judge Thayer warned me that first week, says, don't worry about the big cases. The big cases have the good lawyers and they're prepared. The ones that give you trouble are the little cases, the borderline cases that the good lawyers don't want. They're going to lead you down the path somewhere. And I've been reversed a few times, and almost without fail is one of those little cases that didn't have the big-time lawyers involved. You know, you, you were talking about we have courthouses in Bristol and Blountville and Kingsport. Uh, uh, how did you feel about going? Uh, was that good or bad to have to circulate in that way? I thought it was excellent. Uh, and what, what, wasn't what far to travel. It was uh, 40 minutes from my house to Kingsport, 20 minutes to Bluntville. Uh, we had terms or sessions, and uh, when I got through one, I feel like I'd accomplished something, and I started a new. Uh, at another place, whereas when I held court in Blunt Boy, it was generally in the criminal courtroom, and I felt like I was climbing into somebody's unmade bed there when <laughs> I, all this stuff scattered around that the criminal judge had sat there all the time with. Yeah. Uh, plus, I enjoyed trying cases more in Kingsport than I did in Bristol because in the 40, 45 minutes from Kingsport to Bristol, I could go over the case in my mind and reconcile it out and forget it. And <laughs> when I was coming straight home in Bristol, five minutes in the courthouse, especially domestic relations cases, uh, custody cases, they're still going right on my mind. I still carried them home. Well, that, that, uh were the bar associations different uh, or as far as presenting the cases? One generally help you out more than the other? Oh, not, not too much. I think it's probably tougher on the Bristol lawyers because I'd been so much closer to them yeah. as lawyers, whereas Kingsport, I hadn't tried that many cases. Did you have uh, certain types of cases that you know, that you really like to try, and then on the other hand, did you have certain cases that you just dreaded on the way to the courthouse? Yes. Uh, 
I always said I'd be ashamed to take my check from the state every month if I didn't try domestic relations. I earned every penny of it, penny of it trying domestic relations cases. Uh, there were entertaining times in them. <laughs> uh, I had a lady there in Kingsport. I granted her divorce, and it was her 14th divorce. She, she outdid Miss Hutton, uh, <laughs> Lisbeth Taylor, Zaza Gabor. She had more divorces than all of them put together. And then my favorite one uh, was a middle-aged lady from originally from over in Irwin. Uh, she brought the house down. It was a crowded motion day, and I put her case on first because her lawyer had to get back to Irwin. And he knew I was a stickler for being correct. So after asking her name, he asked her, said, now, you put in the divorce petition that it was your fifth marriage. It's really your sixth, wasn't it? And this old country lady said, yeah, I forgot that, and it died over the weekend. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. But, you know, when it came to custody, it just, you know, the, as you know yourself, there are no good answers so many times. Uh, and it's just tragic. And I see, especially when they were children, female children, 12 to 14 years old, they always felt it was their fault. Yeah. I do remember one of the early days I was on the bench. I had about five or six children, and the man didn't want to pay child support, so he asked for custody, hoping to keep it's long before their child support guidelines. And just out of the blue, the lady says, okay, you can have them. She, she agreed to have custody of all five or six children. I don't know what happened after that. I can't imagine it worked out very well. <laughs> you give him some of his own, huh? <laughs> uh, did you, um, uh, did you try, did you like commercial cases where you really had the one of my favorite was boundary line disputes. Ah. Uh. You don't see much of them anymore simply because they would bring in people 80, 90, 100 years old if they could find them. And they had such interest in the tale. I drove cows across there. That was a chestnut stump on the hill back in 19 and 2 or whatever. And it was just real real interesting witnesses on it. And then uh, if it was a case involving a unique question of law, uh, I always enjoyed those. Uh, uh, had one where there was a crane manufactured in France that was sold to a company in North Carolina that was leased to a company in Kingsport building the hospital and some defect in the crane caused a serious injury to one of the workmen and the plaintiff sued the French manufacturer and it was just a few months after the U.S. Supreme Court case involving Volkswagen so it was a question of the foreseeability and uh, I held the French cane manufacturer in. It went up Tennessee Supreme Court, and that uh, the first case, uh, case first impression in Tennessee on that. Uh, I tried the first case in Tennessee on the what I call the nude dancing law. Uh, you remember the legislature passed a law that county could adopt. Uh, local ordinance restricting uh, nude dancing. And it was interesting from a legal and a practical standpoint because U.S. Supreme Court held that 
nude dancing can come under freedom of speech, but it's limited freedom of speech. I didn't know there was such a thing. And of course, the ordinance said that uh, the dancers had to be a certain distance from the, the clients and there couldn't be alcohols. U.S. Supreme Court says one thing for sure, nudity and alcohol don't mix. And so they were fighting really the distance rule and some other things when they uh, arrested some there in Sullivan County. And uh, they brought in one of the semi-pretty women that has been working there. You know, I was real jealous you got that case. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was testifying how we were infringing on her free speech. <laughs> Said that people had to be too far away. She couldn't talk with the customers freely. And the lawyers let it go with that. Well, I just couldn't resist. It's a non-jury case, and you know I always <laughs> ask questions in a non-jury case. And I said, well, what did you and the customers talk about? <laughs> and she sat there a minute, and she said, you know, Judge, I'd ask them, how the wife and kids? <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I said the, something I never should have said. <laughs> I said, lady, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Tell, in addition to your, your courtroom career, uh, you had a pretty good career with the Judicial Conference. I believe you serve uh, leadership positions. Can you tell us a little well, bit yeah, about that? Yeah, I was always uh, like to get involved in organizations, just like you, John. <laughs> uh, almost immediately, Frank DeWoder was president of the conference when I first entered. He was chancellor in uh, Nashville. And Judge James Jarvis was a uh, circuit judge in uh, Murrville, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, and he was, came president and asked me to be the secretary. And we had a great time together. He and I'd sit and think up wonderful things and he'd get me to introduce them and then they'd be voted down. <laughs> but we had a good time. And uh, I got on committees. I was heading the committee on local rules and this and that and uh, gradually worked up and in 1989-90 uh, was selected as president of the Tennessee Judicial Conference, which I was very proud of, just like you should be proud <laughs> since you're a past president. You, you sure learn a lot, don't you? It's a lot of, lot of fun. And uh, you, you also um, uh, teach the, uh, what I call the Baby Judges School from time I, to time, is that correct? Even uh, before that, I started teaching some to the lawyers. I'm basically a lazy person. And I found out a wonderful thing. If I volunteered to teach, at some point I'd have to prepare because I was fighting, the laziness was fighting my 100% passing grade. So I found I learned so much more about a subject teaching it than I ever knew when I was a student. So then when they started having the Tennessee Judicial Academy, which uh, every two or three years all the new judges would come generally to Nashville and various judges across the state would teach different subjects. And I somehow got in a pattern of teaching uh, uh, Rule 56 motions, summary judgment, and uh, Rule 65 uh, restraining orders and injunctions, and Rule 12 uh, motions to dismiss. If my memory serves me right, your Rule 56 uh, training course uh, was uh, pretty much adopted by the Supreme Court in the decision to help us trial judges uh, in, well, in making rulings and being John, considered on appeal. John Day, attorney in Nashville, who's a friend of mine on a 
committee with me on uninsured motors. He came back from a trial from Midwest, I think. I hope I'm right on this history. But anyway, convinced the Supreme Court to adopt Rule 5603, which says, in support of motion summary judgment and against it, each party will sign, will file a statement of material facts supporting their position. Once that was adopted, I took the position that only thing I'd consider on a summary judgment were those short statements of material fact. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, the lawyers would send you a stack of depositions, a foot high, uh, all kinds of affidavits and requests for admissions and everything, and it is impossible to go through it all. So I rule that I would judge summary judgment just on the 5603 statement of fact, and it went up on appeal on a class action case, a Gordon Ball, and the Supreme Court put stamp approval on that. Unfortunately, not all trial ju judges do that now, and appellate courts do let you get away if the trial judge doesn't do that. They don't require them to, and they're just cutting their own throat by not doing it. Okay. Let me hit you with a bullet. Now that you're retired and you look back over your career, what do you think about the, uh, the separation of chantry and circuit courts today? Is that, what's your opinion? Do you have an opinion on that? Well, the legislature's almost dissolved the differences. Uh, and as a practical matter, when there was redistricting, I don't remember what year it was, many years ago, Judge Thayer and I decided to prevent judge shopping. We started the practice of uh, dividing up the chantry docket and the circuit docket, and the computer would assign a certain percentage to each of us. Uh, so it did away with judge shopping that had gone on before that. So I had a taste of both. And uh, I had mixed emotions about it. I, I like the idea of the old Chancery Court, uh, which of course dates back to early English times when it was the Lord High Chancellor of the King that decided things when the King was too busy hunting or fighting wars or whatever he's doing. And, uh, and it's going to be tough to ever change it because chancellors and clerk and masters across this state are generally pretty powerful uh, political figures. And it is constitutional. Uh, I guess one of the more interesting cases I've ever had, uh, and the only one I had as a judge that went to U.S. Supreme Court is when uh, Chancellor Rainwater in uh, uh, Severeville, Severeville fired his clerk and master. And uh, clerk and master and uh, chancellor are constitutional offices. The clerk and master is appointed uh, by the chancellor, and the chancellor, of course, is elected. And uh, so she saw that the present chancellor was going out. She had already served almost her full term. So she resigned and had the chancellor appoint her to a new term before Chancellor Rainwater came on the bench to get her a new six years. And uh, Thank goodness for him. <laughs> her original term had run out the time he fired her. So I held it was a fraud on the court that there's a special relationship between the chancellor and the clerk and master and that she had the security of six years, but uh, uh, for her 
to circumvent that the way she did of getting a new appointment before her term was out. It was a fraud on the court, and uh, hell, he was correct. And that went to the Court of Appeals of Tennessee, Supreme Court of Tennessee, and then they petitioned for social or U.S. Supreme Court, but it was not granted. Mm. Let me hit you with the second bullet, and then I'll let you rest. What do you think about the current uh, method of judicial selection? Pellet judges, I think it's very good. I think statewide elections for appellate judges is the worst possible thing. I think we've seen that in Texas, in West Virginia. Trial judges, every county except Knox, Hamilton, Davidson and Shelby, I think clearly popular elections the best. Even Sullivan County, which is number five, I think is small enough that enough people know the reputation of a judge that generally has nothing to do with political party, uh, that I think popular election is the way to go. The one I don't have an answer for is those four biggest counties. I hear about candidates spending $100,000 in a judge's election. There's going to be trouble from that sometime. Yeah, that's a... But if you go to the same thing as appellate judges, that's all political, which is all right. The, the, the danger of popular election, the money spending, uh, that danger far outweighs the politics and in, uh, in the modified Missouri plan. Now, with your activities in the conference, you had a good relationship with several of the judges, did you not? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you think that's important to have that collegiality among judges? Very like much so. Very much so. Was that a positive thing? Uh, I think it was even better when I first went on the bench. We'd gather in a different judge's room and talk. I probably learned more about how to handle tough situations visiting with other judges across the state as compared to the classes that are taught at the judicial conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and if nothing else, you know, you. Every judge has his problem areas, feels like he's the only one in the world, and then you get there talking to other judges and you find everybody else is in the same. And that makes you feel better. Yeah. Know their fellow sufferers with the same problems, <laughs> crying <laughs> each other's shoulder. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't have an answer for the big counties in this no. state. I don't. I don't know what to say about it. During your long tenure as a chancellor, have you noticed a change in the judges over the years? Very much so. In what way? I think I could see a change when the salaries of judges went up. You're getting people with a living wage, uh, uh, maybe not making what big time lawyers make, but a living wage. Uh, I saw better qualified people come on the bench, very much so. No doubt in my mind, uh, all in all across the state, we've got good people at the trial level now, very good people. And, uh, and see, uh, I saw in the paper where Judge Thayer's listed one of the highest paid retirees. Well, the reason was they weren't paying anything. I think it paid $12,500 when he went on the bench. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't take much of a pay cut when I went on the bench. As I told you, I was terrible at billing. The, uh, the uh, salary had just gone up some. I think, I don't know, it's around 30000 a year, but it was when they tied the, the uh, 
income to the cost of living with no limits, and it went up 10, 15 percent a year. So at the end of that first full term, we were making a very decent wage. I mean, I hear some of them complain about how much, but they don't, most of them work weekends like lawyers. Most of them don't work many nights like lawyers. They don't worry about the 90-day note coming due to pay the secretaries. You can, a judge can spend whatever time he wants to on a case. People don't expect him to try but one case at a time where a lawyer, you recall, five clients think you ought to be solving their individual clients' uh, problems at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and there's retirement. I didn't have any retirement as a judge. Uh, judging's a good job. Judges don't want lawyers to know what a good job it is. <laughs> well, what do you think the qualities of a good judge are? Okay. You have to be reasonably intelligent and apply that reasonable intelligence to good common sense and you have to do it with a sense of humor and compassion for both lawyers and the litigants and the juries, all with very high ethical standards. Now, you're a certified mediator. A listed mediator. All right. Rule 31 listed mediator. Okay. There are no certified mediators <laughs> in Tennessee. <laughs> What have, what are you noted about mediation, and is it good? Is it, uh, is it, it bad? It, it's it's very good. It's very good. I don't do a lot of it, but for the past three years, I've done quite a few, and uh, wasn't original with me. The uh, someone said, you know, you've done a good mediation when everybody leaves disappointed. <laughs> And, uh, but what I preach, I preach three things at the beginning of the mediation. I tell them, unfortunately, litigation is very expensive now. The longer you go, the more it's going to cost. Two, you've got your regular life to live, but you're spending too much time thinking about this lawsuit, whether it's a divorce or business or a land dispute. But by far, the most important reason to settle by mediation is power. You've got the power to control what the result would be. It may not be a result you're completely happy with, but at least you're deciding what the result is. Whereas if you go to court, you've got 12 jurors you've never seen before and a judge. And I explained to them I've seen as a judge and witnesses get confused, records be incorrect, a million things that can happen to mess up a lawsuit. That nobody can tell you how a lawsuit's going to turn out. But if you decide it here today at mediation, you can control how it turns out. Now there's a nasty word in the media, judicial activism. <laughs> what do you think about that term? Well, I don't quite know what it is. Uh, obviously, when some crazy judge with what we used to call black robe fever uh, ignores the law and just tears off on his own in a case, ignoring the law, that type of activism is bad, shouldn't be tolerated. But in many cases, one judge's reasoned interpretation of the law is another person's judicial activism. Well, yeah. now, kind of going to back to your family, how did be, being a judge affect your participation in civic organizations and your family activities? Well, the good part, I must have been on 10 boards at the time I became judge. I resigned from all of them. 
from being on the board of Mental Health Hospital in Knoxville to Lions Club to everything. That's good to get rid of. I couldn't sell raffle tickets anymore. That was good. <laughs> the bad is I think the judge has to be very circumspect about his personal life. I'd always enjoyed playing literally nickel-dime poker with friends. I've never played poker in the day I was sworn in. I had to talk to my wife and children. Isabel had to be careful talking with friends about subjects of interest in Sullivan County because she would know I may have the case and she would, the others would think she was giving my opinion on that case uh, and the children likewise. And uh, I didn't have a lot of close friends, a lot of friends, but not close friends after I was on the bench. You have to be careful about that. Uh, you have to be careful where you eat, where it stores you go in. I know one night four of us had played tennis. I was the only lawyer and his judge. We went to a pizza place to have a pizza, and a young man brought the pizza out to us and looked down to me and said, you're the guy that took my kid away from me. One of the guys wouldn't eat his pizza. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. <laughs> oh. So, you know that. You have to be careful where you eat, you know, cases you've had. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, the owner of the Bristol Motor Speedway saw my dad and I having lunch together a lot. And I got a letter from him that he was going to give me free tickets to the races at Bristol for me and my dad and place reserve parking and the whole bit. And I went down after thinking about it and said, I can't do that. If I get a case involved in Speedway, I won't be able to okay. try it. I'll try it. So he gave us a ride around the speedway in his car at high speed. And <laughs> I bet that was a kick. That was the end of it. <laughs> Plus, I would have had to report it under the yeah. state laws. Well, do you think that isolation that I guess we all face in this business is one of the reasons we have so many friends within the conference and, I think and usually good friends? I, I think it is. Yeah. Because it's such a limited number of people you can yeah. share your troubles with, professional troubles. At, at the end of the day, and the way you told us you conduct court and what you hope to do as far as the bar, what do you think your main contribution to the bar would be and the way you, well, the way you handle the courtroom? Well, John, uh, when I went on the bench, it made a difference who you were as a lawyer, who the litigant was in the community as to what kind of treatment. Certain lawyers got preferential treatment. Lawyers got away with, I'm not saying they weren't good judges then, but they just handled things differently. Lawyers got away with, in effect, testifying by the way they, what I call speaking objections and saying things in front of the jury. And I'd seen it as a lawyer and I very much resented it because learning under Mr. Gore, I always tried to exercise high ethics. So I said, that's gonna stop. And that's one thing I did stop. I think I said, my ideal situation, if every lawyer in Sullivan County could go try a case in any courtroom in the country and feel comfortable doing it. So I regret that uh, I was too harsh with the lawyers. It was scary when I went on the bench and uh, I came across as too mean. I didn't realize it at the time. I think I sometimes ruled by fear and I regret that. But I think ultimately 
we ended up so you could go to court in Southern County, there'd be a level playing field, that there'd be civility in the courtroom, done it with dignity, people appeared on time, and we got rid of the cases in an expeditious manner, and yet people got a fair shake at presenting their side. Good. And I'm going to ask you two more questions, and the first one then, before I get to the last question is, is there anything else you'd just like to tell us that maybe I haven't asked you about? Well, no. The big regret is I wish I'd been a kinder, gentler judge. <laughs> uh, it was too late to realize that. My biggest uh, disappointment was uh, when Sissy Doherty moved from Tennessee Supreme Court to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, they just changed the law so that you know, they adopted the modified Missouri plan for the Supreme Court. And I applied for the Supreme Court and luckily was one of the three uh, suggested to the governor for appointment Supreme Court and it was Penny White, Janice Holder and I. And I, I knew the governor had already said he'd probably be a woman, but I saw that as my only chance. And uh, I regret I didn't get that. In fact, Penny told me afterwards I'm the one that should have been selected. Yeah. She's a very fine legal mind. Oh, she uh, mm -hmm. But I think she makes a much better professor of law than a Supreme Court judge. Since retiring, you're playing a lot of golf. And how, what, what, what else are you doing in your retirement? Are you enjoying yourself? Immensely. I wondered whether I would uh, enjoy retirement, try to get rid of as many responsibilities as possible. Uh, I'm doing enough mediation. I'm with my son's law firm of counsel. I'm not a member of the firm, uh, but they give me an office and a and a cell phone and a computer and I get to use one of the partner's secretaries for my work. And she schedules my mediation. Mm -hmm. I just show up, try not to get too many of them, and uh, having a wonderful time. And then occasionally you substitute, like you're going to be substituting for me here coming up when not I have my often. surgery. <laughs> Last year I had a week in Sevier County and concluded you made a wise decision retire. <laughs> but I look forward uh, to trying to get rid of a few cases for you, John, uh, in September and October. Uh, I wish you the best in your surgery. Well, thank you. Let me ask you a final question. What career accomplishment has given you the most satisfaction? Just changing the way trials are conducted in the second judicial district. Feel like I've done something useful. Kind of getting back to a level playing field for all. Yes. And I'll have to say it's stuck. You set the standard. And I'm proud of you for making it <laughs> stick. Well, you were my mentor. And uh, I think at this point in time we will uh, then uh, terminate this uh, interview and Judge Ladd, I appreciate you and I appreciate your participating in the Tennessee Bar Project. Well, thank you for being my interviewer. <laughs> All right, thank you.